Gracious God, we come before you on this third, third Sunday in Easter. Bless this time of worship and guide us by your Holy Spirit so that our hearts be open to receive your word and our minds be filled with your wisdom and our actions reflect your love in all that we do. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. May we all rise for the call to worship. <clears throat> Make a joyful noise to the Lord all the earth. Bring forth into joyous song and sing praises. Let the hills sing for joy together before the Lord. The Lord will judge the world with righteousness and the peoples with truth. Opening hymns today is as a God of grace and God of glory, hymn number 577. Good morning. Good morning to all of us who have made it here this morning. Uh, and uh, good morning to uh, those who are uh, watching this later on uh, on YouTube. Uh, and uh, although I know it probably won't be morning, many people will be watching it uh, in the evening and through the week. Uh, and uh, so we uh, say welcome to all. Uh, we are joined together uh, in space uh, and time through the internet, and, uh, and that is a blessing for many of us. Uh, so we uh, come together in worship this morning. Uh, we had a wonderful time of sharing yesterday uh, as we remembered Hal's life, uh, and this coming 
Uh, Saturday at 1.30, we'll be remembering Evelyn Campbell's life. Uh, and uh, so it's been uh, quite a time uh, as we have uh, let go of several of our saints recently. Uh, and uh, so uh, that is on Saturday. Um, our alternative gift fair is, uh, I, I don't see Renee hopping up, so uh, instead of having just one big after church thing, uh, we have split it up for four uh, alternative gift moments. Uh, and uh, that first one of those is coming uh, with all of the disasters that have happened around the world. Uh, we decided to give it to UMCOR and the HEPA project off until uh, August or sometime like that. Uh, and uh, so we will be having, uh, having more about that uh, on May 7th, which is still a couple Sundays away. Uh, and um, then also, uh, this week, uh, we uh, have the men's Bible study at 9 a.m. We have it every other week. Uh, and it is in the Fireside Parlor. Uh, and uh, we also, this week, have church council. So church council is in room 14 on Wednesday at 6 o'clock. Uh, and then other things that are, that are common. Uh, are there announcements that need to be made apart from this? Yes. Here, hold on. Let me give you the microphone. I just wanted to thank everyone again for supporting me and my family at House Services yesterday. <clears throat> Particularly Ben, Teresa, Katie, Lisa, and Bernadette. And uh, for the beautiful video that Matt did, that I've already watched, and Audrey for the wonderful piano playing. I couldn't have done it without all your support. <laughs> all right, thank you. Yes. Um, she segued us into Joyce Concerns. And uh, that was both the joy and a concern. Uh, the loss uh, is continuing, but the joy is there as well. Uh, and so we give thanks to the Lord. Other joys and concerns? Yeah, just a just minute, Stan. Yeah. Stan Moore. I think it's uh, worth pointing out that uh, Kay Grimacy is with us today. This is the first time in quite a while. Yeah. 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 Kay is one of the longest serving members of this church. And back in the 40s, sometimes I didn't ask her, but I know that she's one who's been a member of the church uh, longer than just about anybody else here. Good to see you, Kay. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. Tuesday. Yeah. Tuesday is Rebecca Carson's 21st birthday. Good to see Kevin back in the land of the living. Yes. Others? All right. Oh, in the front, please, the microphone. Good morning. I'm Marissa Hanna, pastoral intern and youth director. I want to share a joy that our youth group is gathering every week and building community well. <laughs> We've been having an amazing time, and I want to uh, thank you, thank you all, uh, for praying us and. Uh, especially the volunteers who have prepared dinner so far. And we, want to, we wanted to let the uh, uh, church know that there are remaining spots uh, to volunteer and feed our students and would love for you to take part in their spiritual journey by keeping their bellies full <laughs> as they learn God's word. So after the worship service, Pastor Hannah's sexy fiance Kevin <laughs> will be going around the church uh, with sign up sign up sheet uh, to recruit volunteers. So if you 
have planned on if you plan on volunteering please find Kevin and after uh, please find Kevin after the service and let him know when you are available thank you thank you Hannah yes yes uh, our youth group meets on Saturday evening from 5 to 7 starts out with a meal um, do, if you know any uh, youth maybe uh, related to uh, to a youth in the area uh, you might bring up our youth gr youth group and if anybody needs a, a ride uh, we can uh, we can get that together as well so uh, we would we would love to have uh, more of our church family and others uh, join in our youth group Ben. So let me know. Yes. You might you might say what a favorite in and out is, and so if someone wants to provide dinner, it could be money. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Just a just a note that if you don't want to come down and cook, um, uh, in and out is a favorite. It seems over and over again. Uh, with you know, I I I, uh, I had I had used too, and we could have been them in and out three meals a day, seven days a week without any trouble. <laughs> So uh, um, just, you can always uh, volunteer to give money and fruits or I, or one of the parents can swing through the now, which we enjoyed last time. <laughs> All right, I think that's it for announcements. And Joyce concerns, uh, stand please, and just uh, greet the people around you with words of peace.
care. We don't have freight today, so we stepped in with a little tambourine help and uh, filled in some of that space. Will Lisa and the kids please come forward? Let the children come, I said, let the children come. Then we'll be as one. Let the children come. Let the children come. Let them come so they can know. I a God who loves them so. I'm come so big and stop rubbing for me, Candy. Just say <laughs> he's chewing it real quick, so we won't know that he's eating candy. It's okay, candy for breakfast, right? Works for me, right? You like candy for breakfast, yeah, yeah. Okay, so Roman and I were having this conversation. I had this whole plan, but he he's changing out my message today. So, highs and lows. Highs and lows. I can, I can probably guarantee you what Romans is going to be because I spent the week with sixth graders. Hi. It's state testing time in Alta It's lovely. Ready? Well, let's go first. Highs and lows. Uh, my high is that we're done with testing. <laughs> <laughs> Me too. Uh, my low is probably that we still have another week of testing. <laughs> no, but the other high. What's your other high? Oh, yeah. And we won our soccer game yesterday. Yay! Yay. Yay. Uh, and how many goals did you get? I got two. Two out of those five were Romans. Woo! Oh, nice. All right. Oh, you don't have to say testing yet. You're a lucky girl. Next year. All right. Got your eyes on them? Okay. My high is I got um, little things from my frocks. <laughs> my little oh. things. <gasps> she doesn't have a low. I love it when you don't have a low. Oh, yeah. Uh, talk to Matt about his charms on his crocs and how many times he's lost them. I think Teresa's found a few, haven't you? Yeah. yeah. Um, you ever find a little Marvel one or a Cinnamon Toast Crunch? Those are the ones that are on Matt's crocs. And he loses them randomly around church. So, see this little plaza thing? You know what it is? Yeah, ask Matt. It's probably his. So, my high is one, I can spend the Sunday with you guys. My low is I got to spend the week with sixth graders <laughs> um, that don't want to do state testing, just saying. Um, it's tough. It's tough for the kids to sit that long. And now that the sixth graders are used to it, sort of. Um, but they're uh, they're a little bit done with it, and uh, side eye Matt, we get a break this week. Yes, um, so it'll be good. It'll be good. Um, but we are gonna go. Cyrus, do you have a high? Do you have something you like this week? Yeah. What you like this week? Mom, we thank you. Do you have something bad that happened to you this week? Something that you were sad about? Yes, I'm Okay. <laughs> All right. Dear Lord, thank you for these children. Thank you for their highs and their lows. Thank you for taking care of them this week and getting them through their travels. As we know that Jesus is with us at all times. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We come now to our time of prayer. We start with the song of prayer. Uh, today we're trying something a little bit different. 
Uh, we are going to have the first verse of Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling, number four, 348. Uh, please remain seated uh, because uh, the, the music will continue, but we will be in silent prayer together uh, for another verse. Uh, so 348, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling. silent prayer, lifting uh, those that have been presented before us, uh, lifting uh, Mike Fowler as he prepares, uh, continues to recover after surgery, and Lou and Joy Shaw uh, as they have their surgery. Uh, remembering um, the families of Evelyn and Linda and Hal in their loss. Uh, remembering our uh, children as they do their state testing and remembering the great joys of having uh, the chance to be together uh, along with Kay, giving thanks to the Lord. Let us pray. Gracious God, we come before as we come before you today, we are grateful for the many blessings that you gave us. We thank you for the gift of life for our families, friends, loved ones, and this community for the many ways in which you provide for us. God, we also come before you with our burdens and concerns. We pray for those who are sick or suffering. We ask for your healing and comfort for those who are ill or in pain, and for your guidance and support for those who are facing difficult decisions or uh, circumstance. We also pray for those who are feeling isolated or alone, for those who are struggling with depression or anxiety, and for those who are grieving the loss of a loved one. We ask that you will, you will wrap your loving arms around them and that you will provide them with the support and encouragement. God, we know that you are God of love and compassion, <coughs> and that you care deeply for each and every one of us. 
we ask that you pour, pour out your blessing upon us and that you guide us as we seek to live our lives in accordance with your will. We pray all these things in the name of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this daily our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. It's time to dedicate our gift and ties. Ushers, please come forward. Please rise for our doxology. Precious God, we know that everything in this world is a gift from you. So we offer you this gift with humble hearts. Strengthen and entrust us to be your faithful disciples. Also may our gift be a reflection of our deep gratitude and love for you. And may they be used to make a positive impact in this world. In the name of Jesus Christ we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, you may be seated. Our cathedral choir will lead us into the word in song, walking in the light.
stay with us for this tomorrow's evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went and he went and stayed with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened and they recognized him and he vanished out of the sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened the scriptures to us? And they rose the same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven gathered together, and those who were with them, who said, The Lord has risen indeed, and appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road, and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. And as they were saying this, this, Jesus himself stood among them. But they were startled and frightened, and supposed that they saw a spirit. And he said to them, why are you troubled? And why did the question arise in your hearts? See my hands, my eye, my feet, that is I myself. Handle me and see, for a spirit has no flesh and bones, as you see I have. And why did and why the sin disbelief why the sin disbelief for joy and wonder? He said to them, Have you anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of bread, a piece of broiled fish. And he took it and ate it before them. Then he said to them, These are my words, which I spoke to you while I was with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses and prophets and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their, then he opened their minds and understanding the scriptures and said to them, Thus it is written, that Christ, that, that the Christ should suffer on the third day rise from the dead, and that the present and forgiveness of sins to be preached in name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem, uh, and you are my witnesses of all these things. And behold, I sent you, I sent, I sent the promise of my Father upon you, but stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high, the word of God. Thank you, Yukaria. It's a, a, a long, long reading. Uh, it comes from Luke, uh, and over the uh, past, uh, uh, well, since Easter, we have been having uh, readings from John that are equally long. Uh, and I'm not exactly sure why the um, people who put together the, le the lectionary uh, wanted to throw in just this one uh, 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 section of Luke. But uh, it does sort of complete the story. And so we've had the story uh, from the, uh, the understanding of John uh, since Easter, and now uh, this just one time of Luke in the whole year that we get to read. Uh, John does make reference to it. And so I think as they put it together, they saw this as the continuation uh, of the story of the resurrection. There's a story that is uh, told about Einstein. Uh, Einstein was once traveling from Princeton on a train when the conductor came down the aisle punching tickets of every passenger. When he came to Einstein, Einstein reached in his vest pocket. He couldn't find his ticket. So he reached in his trouser pockets. It wasn't there. He looked in his briefcase, but couldn't find it. Then he looked at the seat beside him. He still couldn't find it. The conductor said, Dr. Einstein, I know who you are. We all know who you are. I'm sure you bought a ticket. Don't worry about it. Einstein nodded appreciatively. The conductor continued down the aisle punching tickets. He was ready to move on to the next car when he turned around and looked back and saw the great physicist down on his hands and knees looking under the seat for his ticket. The conductor rushed back and said, Dr. Einstein, Dr. Einstein, don't worry. I know who you are. There is no problem. You don't need a ticket. I'm sure you bought one. Einstein looked at him and said, young man, I too know who I am. 
What I don't know is where I am going. <laughs> Apparently a true story. In today's Gospel reading, our two followers of Jesus are on the road to Emmaus. But now that their teacher and master is dead, they really do not know where they are going. Let us be in prayer. Gracious God, we put all things in your hands. We trust in you, even in the face of life's great difficulties, we know that you are here with us. Lord, help us remember to take your hand and find in you the comfort we need to continue day by day. In the name of our Savior, Amen. It was the afternoon before Cleopas and his companion leave Jerusalem for their home in the small village of Emmaus. It is probably his wife who walks with him, as the Gospel of John reports that one of the women at the cross was the wife of Clopas, a common nickname. And it is no surprise that a woman isn't mentioned by name in ancient writings. They have been in the upper room with the frightened disciples. That morning, Mary, Mag Mary of Magdala had burst in, saying the tomb was empty and that she had seen a vision of angels saying Christ was risen. Peter and John had run to the tomb and returned downhearted. Yes, the tomb was empty, but there were no angels to be seen. Only the troubling heap of grave cloths and the head wrapped still coiled as if someone were playing a mean trick. After lunch, the two followers not official disciples, but faithful friends of the teacher, Jesus Christ, started their seven and a half mile journey back home. There was nothing to keep them in Jerusalem now. They walked out of the western gate of the holy city, the one called the Geneth Gate. It was the one Pilate and his Roman legions had marched through one week before, while Jesus rode in on a donkey, the sign of peace, through the east facing beautiful gate. This gate now named Geneth was also the place where three days earlier, Jesus whipped and bloody, carried his cross to the hill called Golgotha, the place of the skull. And there he was crucified. The two plod along with their eyes to the ground, not even sparing a glance at the place where the cross and now once stood and now the empty tomb cut into a rock wall. They would not look, only looking at the ground as they walked. What would there be to see that might return even a little bit of their stolen hope? As the two companions walk, they soon uh, find that, uh, that they need to talk. They let go of their silence. And Clopas starts to talk about the horrible last three days. Jesus warned us that his life would be taken, but we couldn't believe him. How terribly sad for his mother Mary to have to witness such purposeless horror. What do you think Peter and the other disciples will do now? The other follower speaks up. Mary Magdalene says Peter will soon go back to Galilee and resume his fishing. You know, his wife and mother-in-law are still there at Capernaum. Clopas says, I suppose John and James will follow him. Who knows about Andrew? I don't think he ever really liked fishing. Why did it have to be a cross? 
with its pain and its curse. How can anything good come from this? And then there was a stranger sitting at the side of the road who stands and walks alongside them. What is this you are discussing as you walk along? They jerk to a halt and look straight at him. Are you the only stranger in Jerusalem who does not know the things that have been going on? What things? Things concerning Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since this happened. And the stranger says, Oh, foolish ones, slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Was it not necessary that Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And then, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them all the scriptures, the things concerning the Messiah. I have a friend, uh, Reverend Jose Mendel. He's at Rialto. He's the pastor at Rialto. Uh, I was there for nine years. It was the longest in the hundred years of, of the church, hundred plus years. I thought that would stand forever. He followed me a couple ministers later, and he's been there, I think, for 15 now. So, uh, but Jose Mendel, he's, uh, um, he's a good friend. Uh, and he told about uh, how he came to the ministry. He was given a Bible when visiting the church, a church at age seven with his grandparents. Just visiting a church was handed the Bible. His parents did not go to church, and so he grew up knowing nothing about Christianity. But at 19, he was working at a factory, and there, there were magazines uh, outside of the restroom and a Bible sitting on top of them. And he picked up this old Bible, opened it randomly, and started to read, and he was fascinated. He went home, dusted off the Bible that had been given to him so many years before, and started to read. He read by himself, the whole Bible in one sitting. He got down on his knees and gave his life to Christ. He heard a call to be a preacher. And so he went to a Methodist church and found out to be a preacher you have to go to college. And so, continuing his factory job, he went to college, and then to graduate school seminary, and became a preacher. As they walked, Clopas and his companion listened to Bible stories they had heard since childhood, stories like Moses saved from the Nile, and they heard teachings that they now heard every week in the synagogue, the prophets, Joel, Amos, Jeremiah, and the suffering servant of Isaiah. They heard all these stories again, but coming from the stranger and in a new light, the light of Jesus Christ, and it was a dawning of understanding. Yes, the gift of the cross was the only way to overcome human self-orientation and greed. And yes, a resurrection that Jesus had both predicted and taught was the way to open the rest of the world to the grace that they knew as Jews through the covenant with the Hebrews. Cleopas and his friend, or his wife, we do not really know, they were so captivated by this stranger's words that they hardly knew that miles had passed and they were entering their own hometown of Emmaus. But their attention was caught by the singing and merriment going on in the neighborhood homes. 
While the formal meal of Passover was a single day, the festival went on for a week. Before they had met this stranger on the road, the celebration of God's salvation that was the heart of Passover would have been bitter in their mouths. But now it all made perfect sense. Death was the answer needed for freedom and the birth of a new people of Israel as much as it broke God's heart to see any person suffer. This had to be. The bread of the Passover meal had been broken remembering the freedom from slavery and the cup of salvation raised at the end of that Passover celebration, that first night of Passover, was wine of a continuing covenant. And the festival continued. This is our humble home. Well, I must be going on. No, it is almost dark. It's not safe to be walking alone on the road at night. Come share a meal with us and stay in our home for the night. You can continue your journey in the morning. Yes, yes, please stay with us. The stranger smiled, and they entered the small two-room house through a low doorway. As Cleopas gathered kindling and went to the neighbors to get fire for the beehive-shaped oven in the middle of the main room that offered the only heat for the house, his companion mixed flour and water together to make the crude, yeastless flatbread of Passover. Wine was poured from a jug, and the low table was set. Dried fruit, salted fish, probably from the Sea of Galilee, joined the hot bread, and the smells of dinner filled the house. The stranger reached out and took the bread. He gave thanks. He broke it. And suddenly he vanished from their sight. And the two realized only now that it had been the risen Lord who had walked with them. And they said to each other, didn't our hearts burn as he spoke with us on the road? We must run and tell the disciples. They were still fearfully hiding in the upper room. They need to hear what has happened to us today. Yes, it is dark and dangerous, but this news cannot wait until morning. They were so filled with joy that they ran the whole seven and a half miles back to Jerusalem, pausing only long enough to give thanks as they passed the hill of Golgotha. Through the gate and into the small city still celebrating, as they heard the merriment, they smiled at each other, Yes, there is still joy to be had in life and in new life. Coming to the large house where the disciples were, they ran up the exterior stairs that led to the upper room and pounded on the door. Mary, Peter, John, open the door. He has risen. The door swung open. He has risen indeed, and he has already appeared to Peter. Our two followers of Christ had an encounter with the risen Christ that would be repeated a thousand million times. They had their hearts strangely warmed in the reading of the scriptures, the hearing of the scriptures, and in the sacred moment of breaking bread together. And they found there the new presence of the Holy Spirit. As Christians, we share this story with Clopas and his companion. As Methodists, we share a similar story with the founder of our denomination, John Wesley. Wesley studied at Oxford, uh, became a preacher, uh, well-known and quite successful, uh, and so he committed himself to a mission trip to Georgia. And there in Georgia, where he thought he was going to convert the whole Native American race uh, he instead was a complete and total disaster. <laughs> he failed miserably, and in his return home to Great Britain, he was caught in a terrible storm. He was paralyzed with fear for his life, 
but he heard singing coming from a group of Moravians, uh, followers of, of Luther, uh, that were singing down in the, 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 the uh, lower decks of the, of, the, of, the, uh, of the ship. And so he went, went down and, and, uh, and prayed with them and tried to discover what it was that gave them such faith that they were able to sing in the face of the storm. He went back to London, went back to preaching, but he felt faithless and unworthy. He shared his struggle with one of the Moravians, Peter Fuller, uh, a friend, who said, preach faith until you have faith and then preach it because you have it. And, uh, and, and so, so he did that. Uh, and uh, as John counseled others, he saw the, the, the faith just come upon people. And, uh, and, and, and it was very much like the, like the Emmaus story. And he longed for that sort of experience uh, in his misery. Uh, he kept searching and studying uh, and, and uh, going to, to listen to uh, the Moravians and share with them, even though he he found himself uh, just just disappointed in not finding such an experience. And then we read from his journal on May 24, 1738. He wrote this: In the evening, I went very unwillingly to a society in Aldersgate Street where one was reading Luther's preface to the Epistle to the Romans. About a quarter before nine, while he was describing the change which God works in the heart through faith in Christ, I felt my heart strangely warmed. I felt I did trust in Christ, Christ alone for salvation. And an assurance was given me that he had taken away my sins, even mine, and saved me from the law of sin and death. I began to pray with all my might for those who had in more a special manner despitefully used me and persecuted me. I then testified openly to all there what I now first felt in my heart. But he goes on to talk about this and then write uh, for years afterwards in his journal that now while his heart Burned within him, he continued to struggle to know Christ more closely. He writes about this, the realization that even St. Paul had to be blind for three days after his experience on the road to Damascus, and that Paul was years growing in faith before his commissioning as a missionary to the Gentiles. But he also never lost sight of his Lord. So even in his continuing struggle, John Wesley continued to struggle with his faith even after his heartwarming experience. In his continuing struggle, he only grew, grew closer to God. However we start down our Christian faith, we may, may we find ourselves ever closer to the divine. For some of us, it is a singular experience for others of us. It is an experience of growing in faith. It was for John Wesley. As we continue with the struggle, even after we are assured and filled, we find that God continues to speak to us. And even in moments where we question our own faith, we find that God is present. The two disciples, these two followers of Jesus, continued on the path of life, sharing their experience with Jesus Christ, the risen one, and who is to say how easy that conversation was? But Jesus is always with us. 
and we can trust even as we learn to trust more. May we follow so closely our Savior and Lord. Amen. Our closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord, number 593. Let's stand as we sing, 593. Why?